On this Aviation Special, we get insight from both higher education and K-12 about the future of learning, what they have learned through COVID-19, and what they see coming down the pipeline. All that and more next on this AV Nation special. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. This is an AV Nation special, the future of learning. This is an AV Nation special. My name is Tim Albright. Uh, we are previewing AV3, our one-day conference on June 17th with our friends over at SCN and Avixo. With me, uh, actually, to preview one of my sessions, the future of education. First and foremost, Sandra Paul. Sandra is the director of IT for the Township of Union. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. Also with us, uh, Julie uh, is, is is my neighbor by state. Uh, not exactly, but you'll get it in a second. Uh, Julie Johnston, uh, Acting Associate Vice President for Learning Technologies at Indiana University. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you so much. So let's start uh, this. Um, where both of you have had very interesting, let's say, 12, 18 months uh, in the education space, uh, making sure that your students have got the education that they need, as well as the technology and making sure that your faculty and, and, and staff have got what they need. Sandra, we'll start with you. As we are recording this, it's towards the end of end of May, obviously the end of, of, of the school year. Uh, the session that we're having is in June. Most likely, both of you are getting ready for next year. What, Sandra, have you guys done in the last couple of months to prepare for next year? And what are you learning as, as you, you do kind of have a hybrid model at least for the next at least for the next next school year and possibly the next two school years well right now um our governor has decided that we are not going to offer remote learning at all in the fall so um, um that has changed a couple of times but uh, as of right now i know there's no virtual learning at all for this coming september but in preparation just in case if something similar happens again um, where he um, closes all our schools, we're preparing all our classrooms to do hybrid learning from um, K through 12th grade. One of the ways we have been doing it basically is we've been um, using a TV type touch panel that has um, interaction for not only the teachers inside the classroom or the students inside the classroom, but we also have it where it can also be interactive for a student at home. So um, there's a web-based device that comes with the device, uh, web-based software that comes with the device and the students can join the class and both students at home or inside the classroom have the ability to interact with it. So it, I mean, as far as basically what we've been doing, um, it has actually been pretty stressful because no one anticipated this would happen. And um, in my 20, over 20 years of being in K-12, this is the first time I've actually had to try and figure out how to do both school in a building and school at home. So it's been interesting um, in trying to figure out what to really do. And we've some things that have worked is compared to what I was talking about, making sure every student has a device, making sure every teacher has a device has been also um, been very productive. Uh, we've been doing a lot of pilots with different types of software that for educational purposes, um, you know, and then also the different policies we've come up with, you know, do you keep a camera on? Do you keep a camera off? Do you, you know, those are just some of the things that we've been going through. Um, we've come up with, I think, a pretty good program for the fall, and um, I'm looking forward to see what's going to happen in the future. Uh, I think it's a great time to be in education, even stressful, but it's still a fantastic time to be in education. I, I, I do love your attitude because I agree with you. It, it is it is a it's an a, a, a interesting time, uh, certainly a stressful time, but also one that that, that lends itself to creativity and innovation. Um, Julie, from your perspective, as, as you and, and the, the folks at, at Indiana get ready for the next semester and, and, and possibly, you know, even some summer classes, what are you guys learning, um, both about what, you know, the hybrid, the, the technology available, 
Um, but also, as Sandra put, pointed out, some of the policies that you guys have had to develop. What are you learning as you get ready uh, for quite possibly, you know, a hybrid, a hybrid year or two? Well, actually, we're trying to get back to normal. We're, we're, we're hearing that we want as many students back on campus as possible. And so, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is uh, the hybrid and or high flex may be not the norm, but the exception. So uh, what's going to happen for us is uh, just uh, working with the faculty that want to continue this. So we're asking faculty, what do you want to keep? What do you want to keep in the classroom that you've learned from this past year? And some of the things they want to keep are uh, the connection uh, virtually for, you know, student collaboration groups, for example. And so that's new, this new feature of everyone was on Zoom or everyone was on Microsoft Teams. And so how can we leverage that and en encourage flexibility and collaboration? We also have learned that they wanna keep uh, some type of an online presence for their courses. Uh, we already had had Canvas available for all faculty, but there's a new escalated use of, of that tool, thus, and keeping that, keeping a, a, an online presence to support their on-site curriculum uh, will be something else they want to keep. They also want to keep uh, video. So we are expanding that. We've expanded and created video production studios at all of our campuses. So we'll have the ability for faculty to go in and, and produce high quality video work, as well as the ability to just create more engaging video content. We're launching some video projects with a company called PlayPosit, which allows you to create interactive videos and instead of just segmented videos. So stop checkpoints for students to check for understanding. So the classroom designs itself as we move forward and we are creating new classrooms, we're obviously thinking a lot more about with smarter cameras and smarter microphones. Uh, the, the classroom design of two years ago does not look like the classroom designs moving forward. We're constantly thinking, what can we do now as we move forward with classrooms that could be more high flex as faculty want to continue to try that mode. All right, real quickly, if somebody's not familiar with, with the, the software Canvas, can you give somebody kind of a, a 30 second uh, pitch on what exactly that does. Sure. Canvas is an online course management tool. Uh, thus, you can generate all types of course activities. You can post your syllabus. It's a communication tool with all of your students. It keeps um, all of the content for your course in one, one spot. You can deliver an entire course online through Canvas or just have it as an enhancement to your face-to-face -face class. All right, very good. Sandra, one of the things that, that we have, I, I have a kid, in, a, a child in, in middle school as well as in, 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 uh, in high school here. Um, one of the things that, that we've all kind of learned over the last year or so is, is having that, continuing that, that interactivity, right? Uh, and whether the, the this classes are, are going to be continued as, as hybrid, or flex, you know, one of the things that, that, that all of the instructors, at least that I've talked to, are, are talking about is making sure that, that the collaboration, the, the two-way communication, Teachers, certainly, but what are some of the other areas and some of the kind of the hurdles that you guys have faced over the last year in making sure that everybody can, can be heard and that you, you can have that interactivity? So that has been definitely a, a hurdle we had to go over. And, um, you know, ensuring that, um, you know, teachers have devices inside the classroom, but then the, we also, because we're one-to-one -one where every student actually was given a district device, uh, the students have that ability. The only issue sometimes is that you get the, um, the echoing because the kids are talking on their device plus the kids at home. And, you know, so it's been a juggling situation. One of the things that we've um, tried to basically do in a lot of ways is try to assist our teacher by providing certain skill levels and training so that they know basically how we, they can juggle between those things. But we've also piloted quite a few um, devices to try and see how we can um, make it more interactive for both students in school or outside of school. Like um, one of the things that we had um, talked about was ensuring that all students were engaged, you know, making sure there's an engagement for all kids. So just like Julie was talking about was, you know, the collaboration rooms and stuff like that, you know, having where we use both Google 
and all, Google Meet, and we also use Zoom. We have we give our teachers the choice between the two. So because of that, there are breakout rooms. And because teachers know how to create the breakout rooms, how to use the break, breakout rooms and everything else, but also how to monitor the breakout rooms. You know, we are talking about K-12. So because of that, yeah, we do, you're right. And now, and one of the I, things- I'm, is, I'm, I'm laughing that someone embarrassed because my son is probably one of the reasons why you have to monitor those rooms. So go ahead. <laughs> right. Because one of the things is that everything actually is authenticated. So we make sure that, you know, their accounts are authenticated, making sure we don't have anybody from the outside trying to get into their stuff. And um, because of that reason, you know, we have a certain privacy requirements for K-12, both federal and state level. And then there are the policies for the school district regarding private student privacy that we have to follow. But we want to make it as engaging as possible for students, both at home and also inside the classroom. So the audio video video part of it, what we've done this year was because everyone actually had a device, everybody is using that device. But we've been piloting certain sound bars and video bars inside the school district to try and find something that would work um, you know, smoothly for our teachers and be able to do that but we're still in the process this is not something that you know we've decided on or anything yet we're still piloting stuff yeah absolutely julie one of the areas that, that I'm, I'm fascinated in and I, i'm i'm reminded of 10 years ago maybe 15 years ago uh when i was a tech manager we tried to m migrate uh our staff our faculty rather from vhs's over to dvds and, and one of the air issues was, first of all, technology, but secondly, is is changing how they teach and and and, and, and in what order. Are you finding any any sort of of you know issues? The 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 big word here is pedagogy, right? Is is how they're teaching, right? But but are, are there any issues or what sort of hurdles have you guys found in this hybrid model, in this flex model, um, to you know, the, the teaching? Is it you know making sure that there's enough? Um, high quality videos so they can start doing the flip classroom so they can send the the material home home but you know back to the campus back to the dorm rather and then when they get you know to class they're able to to do that what are you guys finding when it comes to changing and, and arranging the the teaching styles so we had launched an active learning initiative called mosaic and if you want to check it out it's mosaic.iu.edu uh, around faculty support and pedagogy in active learning classrooms. And after a five-year period, we had a significant amount of faculty who had gone through that, that program together. And what we found was that the faculty that had taught in an active learning way and in, in that type of pedagogy have been able to translate that well to the online environment. So taking those strategies that were on site and being able to quickly translate them to, oh, well, we'll just, we'll just uh, digitally do this type of activity uh, has been very successful for them. Now, um, from a whole, and you know, we have a lot of faculty, I, I'm sure there's been challenges that we don't know about, but that is just a kind of a success story on, on the side of the active learning uh, faculty members. As well as, you know, the video, we had already distributed the lecture capture in every classroom, and so faculty were very comfortable with the lecture capture capabilities before the pandemic. So every classroom had that capability. We were a little ahead of the, proactively ahead of the curve on capturing content to the cloud with a company called Kaltura, which then auto captions it. So uh, being ahead of that type of technology has assisted us with the adoption during a crisis. One of the things that we've had um, is that um, we've done a surveys from when we had the actual, before September of last year, we actually did surveys with the, the parents and with the students and we've, we found out that our parents prefer the synchronous learning. So it's live learning taking place immediately at the same time. Um, and the reason being is that we found that kids actually were more engaging once it was a live lesson compared to doing something asynchronously. So because of that, since September, we have actually done more synchronous learning. Most of our virtual learning was done synchronously rather than asynchronously. You know, um, it required a lot of training 
just to let you know. It required summer was summer last year was like bombarding with a lot of training. Okay. And um, we have an assistant director of instructional technology that does a lot of that type of training and coaching. And um, there are videos that he's created that um, if a teacher has an issue, they can go back and look at. Um, he, you know, he's available right now. He does. He's been doing trainings through PLCs, professional learning communities that we have in every um, school, and actually at every grade level. So it requires a lot of training for you to be able to do the synchronous learning because you know you're juggling both the technology and also your content at the same time. So because of that, that's the reason why we did it the way we did. Um, but since we've come back in, we came back in um, after spring break and we've been doing hybrid. We have two cohorts. Uh, one set of cohorts, uh, kids come on a Monday, Tuesday, and then we have another set of kids that come Thursday, Friday. Actually, from what I understand, um, either next week or the week after, we're gonna have both cohorts combined, but they're still gonna come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is going to be our deep cleaning day and then Thursday, Friday. Yeah. So since we're going to be doing the combination, we still will have a set of students that will be virtual only. But our governor has decided that um, coming September, all kids should be back inside the school. So because of that, um, in the state of New Jersey, uh, school districts may not be offering a virtual option. But that can change. And let's let's kind of pull on that thread for a second because I, I want to get this from both of you because uh, the, the name of the of the of the panel is the future of of instruction the future of, of teaching. Talk for a second, and Sandra, we'll start with you. But Julie, I want I want to get your two cents on this too. Both of you and your school districts um, ostensibly have spent an awful lot of time, energy, and money over the last 12, 13, 14 months making these hybrid systems possible, making these virtual systems possible. What does it look like to you if the state of New Jersey says, you know what, we're not doing remote anymore? That's great. Sandra has all this equipment here. What does she do with it, right? What, what, what are you exactly are you guys, how are you evolving your classrooms to incorporate? So this technology is just not lost costs, right? So you can start incorporating and, and really kind of reuse or re-leverage some of this technology that you've spent the last year installing. One of the things what we're hoping to what we're hoping to do is basically still leverage it, leverage it in a way like just like how Julie was talking, maybe capturing in by flipping, doing the flipped classroom situ, um, you know, type of uh, modality for instruction, where basically you know the teacher would basically be teaching via video, and the students would watch it like overnight as homework or whatever it is, and then by the time they come back into it, then basically they would be actually having discussions, just like how uh, Julie was talking about. The one thing that it actually, um, that type of um, teaching helps with basically is the differentiation within the classroom. Because now you can actually focus more on kids who might actually have an issue than students who may not have an issue in understanding certain content. So because of that, that's one of the things we're hoping to do. The other part of it that we're hoping to do is still be able to look at it as the possibility of that there's um we have to prepare for anything like this happening again that we have a virtual system we cannot just say all right because the governor said september we're not gonna you know the state of new jersey is not gonna have a remote option or a virtual option doesn't mean that it goes into a closet somewhere and gathers dust no it means that now we can be a lot more creative and innovative inside the actual classroom too because now you have the ability to go way beyond than the four walls you know right now i mean i we could actually have some of our students be taking courses with julie's professors or you know her classes and be able to say okay let's do a dual enrollment you know rather than take some of my math classes here inside my high school i'm going to be taking it with University of Indiana, you know, that type of thing. There's a lot of, to me, I think this whole thing, uh, I'm getting a little bit too excited, but this whole thing, I think, opens opens the realm of education at K-12 to actually go to K-20 rather than just K-12. I should say pre-K-12. I keep forgetting pre-K. Please forgive me. 
That's right. I, I haven't thought about pre-K in probably 10 years because, you know, it's what, it's what happens when, you're, when your kids are there. But Julie, she, uh, Sandra actually makes a really good point, and it's something that, oh, good Lord, almost 20 years ago, let's put it that way, when when the iPhone first came out and, the, and iTunes and, and, and uh, that entire platform, I explicitly remember you know, um, watching Harvard University you know, uh, lectures and, and lectures from Princeton, lectures from, from Stanford and going, this, this is fantastic right now. I wasn't getting a degree, but it was still, you know, fascinating to me. Fast forward almost 20 years. What Sandra just mentioned, the fact that, that the dual enrollment, which a lot of, of communities have, and if you don't, you can send me an email. I'll send you at least the one from Illinois that I'm familiar with, where you guys can start partnering with, whether it's Sandra's folks for, you know, dual enrollment or dual credit in high school, or providing education, you know, outside of the Indiana University, you know, geography. Yeah, so a couple of items I, I think I could add on to for that. During the pandemic, the two badging companies that are one of some of the top badging companies for credentialing, Badger and Credly, they have expanded by 96%. And that is because of the uh, opportunities, the, the the way that we need to think differently about higher education. We are we are we are using uh, a co expand classes. It's expand.iu where we are going to we're going to create these opportunities for others to take our coursework for a nominal fee and get some kind of digital badging credential. So that's one new, tr it's, it's not a new trend, but because of the pandemic, it's exponentially increased. And I think a lot of universities will start thinking differently about how they deliver a lot of their micro credentialing and many micro um, graduate course programs. So that's one way. Another, just to also mention, Sandra is excited about the possibilities of opening up the world to her students. We are too. And one of the ways we're doing that is in the past, I don't believe that a lot of our faculty would have thought about bringing all, a lot of guest experts into the classroom. The, it, it happened, but now I think, I believe it could happen at scale. We're creating a directory of all of our, we work with all of the major corporations, Adobe, Microsoft, Apple, we have all of these really high-end resources at our fingertips being part of the university technology services. And we're going to create a directory that the faculty can tap into to either create real-world projects where those experts come into the classrooms, or even if it's just uh, on a topic base. And that could easily translate into the K-12 arena also now that they have all of that technology available to them. It's also is that it expands the resources because like one of the things that happened with us is that um you know like i said we normally have like say for instance class sets of books for kids to read at a certain lexile level or you know uh whatever level it is and it's inside the classroom once this pandemic hit the kids couldn't get to the books so what happens the media specialist librarians in my district we started expanding our e-textbooks, our e-book systems. And because of that, now we actually have class sets of e-books that kids can get onto online using their devices and be able to be a part of um, a, a real virtual learning experience that was not available to them before. So now the, re the resources that are now going to be available for them is going to be so much vaster beside, well, I should say more vast, than it's ever been before, because now not only can we reach out to Julie to get her instructors to be subject matter experts to talk to our kids, but they could also you know, say to them, okay, well, if you wanna go into the technology field, this is where we're doing it. So now we're going to school counseling. And now you know, there's a whole realm that this has expanded for K-12. Uh, you know, I don't know higher ed that well, but I know there's a realm K-12 is looking to expand into that I know is going to give our students a future that I think is going to be great because it's going to be actually giving them a skill that they're going to need in order to function as citizens in this inf information age that we're in at this present time. 
Yeah, I would, I would love to talk about the ETEX program. We, we do have an ETEX program that has been in existence for 10 years. And over the 10 year period, we saved our students $69 million. And it's because, it's because higher, you know, these, these courses, uh, you know, the textbooks are so expensive and then the cost is so astronomically cheaper for a digital book. However, in addition to that, in our eText library, we have relationships with vendors for more interactive digital content. And so, like Sandra said, all of a sudden now they're they're migrating to these really more engaging platforms for for our students in in lieu of the traditional textbook. And so we'll just see that grow. Uh, we we are now at 60% of our students have at least one digital book or digital curriculum of some sort. And I can't imagine why that wouldn't also translate to K-12, especially with your one-to-one -one, uh, initiatives that you have. That is absolutely, and it'd be fascinating to watch this as it as it evolves. Uh, thank you both so much. Uh, I look forward to, to spending some more time with you on June 17th. Sandra Paul, if somebody wants to connect with you, how do they do that? Uh, they can, I am on Twitter at spaul6414. Um, they, so that's normally the easiest way to get a hold of me. Just connect with me there and um, I follow me and I'll follow you. All right, very good. And Julie Johnson, how do people connect with you? They can also connect with me on Twitter at JohnstonJ1. All right, very good. Uh, for us, for Aviation, go by our website, aviation.tv. That's aviation.tv. Uh, but more importantly, go by uh, the AV3 website, AV3 event, uh, and register. I uh, will see you June 17th. I'll be able to uh, to hang out with these two fine ladies uh, for about an hour um, talking about the future of learning. So all that and more at avianation.tv. That's avianation.tv.